Okay, uh, last Sunday I preached a, a message called Treasures Unseen, and I only treat, preached one third of it, and uh, I had 20 points, I got through seven of them last week, and uh, somebody or two said, well, what about the rest of it, so I think we'll finish it today and next Sunday, this will be our Thanksgiving theme uh, for the last couple, for the next week or two. Uh, and we'll thank God, look at some things we can thank the Lord for. And uh, we preached on, like I said, six or seven last week, and we'll try to get six or seven in this week, amen? Uh, Psalm 100 says this, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. In other words, when you come to church, you ought not come to church sad. You ought to come to church and with gladness and serve the Lord as you come. And come before his presence with singing. Uh, that's talking about your emotions, your heart, uh, and your devotion. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And he is our shepherd, amen. He's our good shepherd. He's our great shepherd. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Uh, when you read this, I believe he is talking here about going into the uh, tabernacle or the, t uh, the temple back in the Old Testament to uh, worship the Lord. That was the place where the uh, Jews met uh, for their public worship at that time. That was the central location. And um, I believe this church here, this building we have here, in essence, is a place of worship. Uh, it's where a place we've set aside, dedicated uh, to the purpose of worshiping God. Uh, we don't do anything here except... Uh, things that go along with the worship and the service of God. That's what we're for. We're a spiritual organization, amen? And uh, we come together as a church body to worship the Lord together. And uh, so I believe we can take that and apply that to us in the New Testament. Uh, enter, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. It says, be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. Look at uh, Psalm 60, I think it's Psalm 69. And Psalm 69, down in verse number, um, I can't find the exact verse, but here's a good one, because there's lots of thanksgiving verses in the Old Testament. Look here at Psalm 69, and look here at verse number um, 29, verse 29. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song, that's our song service, and will magnify him with thanksgiving. We magnify him as the giver because he's given to us. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bullock that hath horns and hooves. In other words, God would prefer to have you Praise him with a song and magnify him with thanksgiving than to give him an offering of anything. Uh, verse 32, the humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God. He says here, those that see and hear you praise the Lord and magnify his name with thanksgiving and honor him, those that are humble are going to see this and they're going to be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God. So you take somebody who's a humble believer, he's going to appreciate the worship of God that he senses in a church or among an individual. And lost people, I believe, also will be able to see that, tell there's a difference between religion and Bible salvation. And so we're going to look at some more things today we can thank God for as Christian people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this day and for your blessings. Thank you, God, for the chance we have to meet in church, to sing songs of praise to your name. And, Lord, to give thanksgiving unto your name for what you've done for us. Uh, Father, we thank you that you're a God that uh, loads us with benefits daily, God. And, Father, we thank you for the invisible blessings that we have that we really can't put our hands on. But, Father, we know they're real and they're true because your word tells us about them. And help us today, Lord, to uh, bless your name for all those things you've done for us spiritually, God, that uh, even though we can't see them, we know they're true. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the, uh, I read a quote to you uh, week, uh, last week where um, uh, one man said this. He said, our biggest problem in the church today is this vast majority 
of Sunday morning Christians who claim to have known the Master's cure and who return not at other times to thank him by their presence, their prayer, their testimony, and their support of his church. In fact, the whole Christian life is one big thank you, the living expression of our gratitude to God for his greatness. But we take him for granted, and what we take for granted, we never take seriously. And so that last statement there, what we take for granted, we never take seriously. And so we need to seriously consider what God's done for us so that we don't take for granted what he's done for us. Amen? Uh, God has granted us a lot of favors. God has granted us many blessings, material blessings and spiritual blessings. And because he's granted those to us, we ought not take them for granted, lest we not take them seriously. Amen? Amen. Uh, and so uh, we're going to talk this morning again about some of the things we mentioned last week, just to, uh, just to refresh our memories. Uh, but we're also going to look at some other things that we could say that God's done for us uh, that we could praise him for. Uh, our text again says, Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Uh, Ephesians 5.20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're to be thankful people. And we're going to talk about what the... You take in Ephesians chapter 1, that chapter there, God's, or the, the writer says in verse 3, that God has blessed us as believers with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And so we have spiritual blessings. That's treasures unseen. That's invisible blessings, again, that we can't see and necessarily lay our hands on. Uh, the only thing we can really lay our hands on is the Bible, the book that we have in our hand. Amen. That is what we can lay our hands on that's tangible, that's real, that tells us about all the things that we can't see. Amen. Because God revealed them through his word. So let's look at some things that God has done for us that we can thank him for. And I mentioned last week that God has given us the promise of eternal life. He's given us the permanence of salvation. He's given us the pardon of sins. Uh, he's given us a personal relationship with him. Uh, we talked about the persuasion of the Holy Spirit of God that uh, convicted us of our sin and brought us to a place of faith in Christ. We talked about the pull of the cross, how that Jesus Christ would be lifted up and draw all men unto him. That included us that are saved. And we talked about the persistence of soul winners. There was somebody in your life... Uh, your mom, your dad, a grandparent, a friend, a preacher, a Sunday school teacher, uh, somebody at school, the gym, somebody, uh, maybe more than just somebody, maybe somebody's had actually witnessed to you and given you the gospel and prayed for you, and because of their persistence, you eventually became a Christian. Amen? And if you're doing what you're supposed to do, somebody else could thank God for your persistence, that you witnessed to them, gave them a gospel track, invited them to church, and tried to talk to them about their souls. So we're going to continue on now. That was seven things we mentioned. We'll try to get through six or seven this morning. Let me say this. We can thank God for the partaking of the divine nature. The partaking of the divine nature. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 2. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 2. The Bible says this. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. God has called us to glory, that's heaven. He's also called us to virtue, that means goodness. Uh, God has called us to glory in the sense that he saved us and he's given us an everlasting home in heaven. But he's also called us to virtue, which means good. Goodness, that means living a good life, amen? The Bible talks about a good man, that God's going to order his steps and see that he makes it through life, amen? The Bible talks about a righteous man, which is a good man. He may fall down seven, six or seven times, but he's going to get back up by the grace of God and keep serving the Lord, amen? He's not going to quit. He's going to serve the Lord with gladness, like we read in Psalm 100. But he says here that God, uh, according to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So whatever you need that pertains to your life, your personal life, your business life, your political life, your religious life, your home life, and godliness, God says here he's given us all things that pertain to those areas of life. Amen? Amen. So you've got everything you need. Where do you find it? It's through the knowledge of him 
that it called us to glory and virtue. That is, it's knowing God and Jesus Christ our Lord. Look what he said in the verse, verse 2 there. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then he says here that we can have this divine power uh, to live a life of godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him that it called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now notice what he said here. He said God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of God and His Son. And he said that these things are given, this power is given unto us, how? Through these exceeding great and precious promises that he says by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now within you and I that are saved, there's a divine nature now. Uh, nobody's born divine. The only person ever born divine was God's Son, Jesus Christ. All the rest of us are born as sinners, amen? We're sinful human beings. We're fallen creatures. Uh, we're not born righteous. We're not born just. We're born innocent, but we're not born saved and righteous. And uh, so he says here that um, uh, this divine nature that's within us, we've gotten that because we received Christ as Savior, and Christ in us is the hope of glory, and Christ is in us in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? Our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. We've been bought with a price, and we're supposed to glorify God with this body. That is, we're to take advantage of these precious promises, uh, these exceeding great and precious promises, uh, that pertain to life and godliness so that we can live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Amen? Amen. And uh, so uh, this divine nature, man is not born with a spark of divinity in him like a lot of the people have taught. A lot of Eastern religions and, and a lot of liberal, uh, even Protestants somewhat believe that kind of thing, that we're born good and then we go bad. But the fact is we're born bad. We come out of the womb. The Bible said speaking lies. The Bible said that we're children of wrath. Because we've disobeyed God. Now, as, you, as you're born, as you're a young person, as you're an infant, I mean, you're innocent. You can't commit a sin as a three-month-old baby. Uh, you can't commit a sin probably as a one-year-old kid. Uh, maybe by the time you're three years old, three and a half, maybe at that point you're starting to realize that, you know, maybe you start. Maybe at that point you start feeling guilty for some things, amen? And that's showing the conscience is starting to take, uh, starting to kick in. And that they're starting to realize the difference between right and wrong. And at some point later on in life, don't know how old it is, uh, but at some point uh, you're going to experience uh, the guilt of sin and you're going to realize that you're a sinner who needs to be forgiven and needs to be saved through faith in Christ. You'll come to that point at some time in your life if you've been raised around uh, good gospel preaching and Bible teaching. But these great and precious promises in the Word of God uh, are allow us to partake of the divine nature. So we've got that divine nature within us, the Holy Spirit. Now, the way that we tap into God's power, and somebody put it this way, God's got a power grid, and he's given us a divine nature, and we can plug ourselves into that, that, to that divine power grid to tap into God's power to energize us and empower us to live the Christian life. God's given us that ability. What we've got to do is learn how to plug in to God's outlet, amen, so that we can experience the power of God in our lives. And I believe that when you're in fellowship with God, you're plugged in. And when you sin and get out of fellowship with God, it's like unplugging the power, amen? Uh, some people, you know, they trip over the, the wire and the fan goes off, the lights go off, the radio goes off, the TV goes off. What happened? Well, somebody tripped over a cord, amen? I remember reading this in a book called the, uh, I think it was called The Greatest Game is the name of the book. But it was about the first televised football uh, championship between the uh, Baltimore uh, Colts, amen, with Johnny Unitas and the New York Giants with Frank Gifford and those guys. And it was the first televised time. And they were concerned that uh, they weren't going to get much viewership because everybody was interested in baseball. That was America's pastime. Football just wasn't apparently as popular as baseball was. But they were trying to, you know, get it popularized. So here they are going down to, the, I think it was the last play of the game in the championship year, first ever televised, and then the TV screen went off for like five minutes across the country. What happened was, is one of the cameramen or somebody was walking along and there were so many cables and cameras, he tripped over this big cable and unplugged everything. 
And so it was just a blank screen for like five to ten minutes until they got it fixed. And everybody that didn't like football was like, man, what's going what's gonna to happen next? And by the time they got the TV back on, it had already happened. <laughs> and they missed it, amen. They had no replays back in those days. But they got unplugged from the power and the, everything went off. And so sometimes, you know, you'll, you know, you'll stumble into sin or something. You'll unplug the power cord. Sometimes you deliberately unplug the power cord. And uh, when you do that, that's when you get out of fellowship with God and you've got to confess, 1 John 1, 9, your sins to God so He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness, amen, and forgive your sins and restore your fellowship and get you plugged back into the power source so that you can have what you need to serve God, amen. And I think that's what he's talking about there. The partaking of the divine nature allows you to overcome your sins. you got a particular sin that's got you down, a particular sin that's got you enslaved, that you can't give up. Maybe you like alcohol. Maybe you like cigarettes. Maybe you like smoking dope. Maybe you like this. Maybe you like looking at this or listening to that. And there's some things that have just got a grip on you. You can overcome those things. How? Because you've got the divine nature within you. You just simply have to tap into it. Amen? Amen. And you'll do that by plugging into God, by staying in fellowship with Him, and doing what you're supposed to do and mind in Him. Amen? So we have the partaking of the divine nature that gives us victory over the sins of uh, that uh, want to ruin us and rule us. Amen? That's one thing we can thank God for. We can have victory in our Christian lives over sin uh, through the partaking of the divine nature that God's placed within us. And secondly, let me say this. Uh, we can thank God for the prayers of Christian people. The prayers of Christian people. In the book of Acts chapter 12, you have Peter and James. They're in jail, in prison, and uh, James winds up being beheaded uh, by Herod uh, Peter hasn't died, but he's in prison, and uh, they knew this, and the Bible said Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So I no doubt Peter thanked God for the prayers of Christian people that time, amen? Uh, maybe if they prayed sooner, James could have got out. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, uh, God's will was for James to be the one to suffer, and Peter suffered, but he got delivered. And so this church prayed for him. The church there in Jerusalem prayed for Simon Peter that God would deliver him from prison and from death. So prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So the church got a burden for Peter, and they prayed without ceasing. Uh, they prayed around the clock. They prayed every waking moment. Uh, as a church unto God in behalf of Peter so that Peter would be delivered. Peter at that time was the leader of the church. Uh, Paul is yet to come on the scene as the leader at this point, I believe. I think in, later on he becomes the leader here, but Peter now is the primary apostle that uh, God is using at this point. And um, so um, when he gets in prison, they're like, okay, well, there goes his ministry, uh, there goes our leader, we've got to do something, and so they pray. And what they do is they pray prayers of intercession. Uh, intercessory prayer means you go in prayer for somebody else in their behalf. You're not praying for yourself, you're praying for somebody else. You're praying for them uh, and their deliverance, uh, you're praying for them and their deliverance, and also you're praying for them that God won't take them yet, because... You hope that God's going to continue to use them in your life and the life of the ministry, amen? Uh, you take, there's some ministries that it depends on one person. Uh, if one person dies, the next guy's just not going to be able to do what the first guy was doing. Uh, you, and that's what leads to apostasy a lot of times, particularly when, uh, you take for instance, uh, you have a lot of churches where uh, the sons take over for the father. After the ministry, he, the, the father's been pastor for 30, 40 years and then the son takes over. Well, if he's called to preach and uh, God leads, that's fine. But not every preacher's son is called to preach, by the way. Not every preacher's son is called to take over and pastor the church that he pastored. It's just, uh, it just, uh, it's just not meant to be that way all times, but sometimes you have that. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't work out. Um, what I'm saying is there are some people that are key to the ministry that you don't think you can live without. And sometimes God does take those people. And it may be because God's done with that ministry or God wants to do something greater with that ministry or whatever. But the fact is they're praying for God to deliver this particular man because of his ministry and their love for him. He's basically their pastor at this point. 
So you could say they're praying for their pastor, amen, that he would not be uh, destroyed, would not be executed, but he'd be freed to come back and minister again. Uh, I believe this church, when they prayed, I believe they did this. I believe they were united in prayer. They were all together. And they also were unified in purpose in their prayers. Not, not only were they united, that is, congregated together, but they were unified as they were together. Everybody was in agreement. Everybody was in accord with what they were praying about. We're going to be here today. We're not praying about this and that or that person. We're praying for Peter, and we're praying specifically that God will deliver him. And the Bible tells, tells us that God did deliver him, amen, as a result, I believe, of the prayers of Christian people and of the church. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 18. Look at Matthew chapter 18. And in Matthew chapter 18, look here at uh, verse number uh, 20. Look at verse number 20. Matthew 18 and verse 20. Matthew 18 verse 20. Uh, Jesus said this, For where two or three are gathered together in my name. Okay? Here are some people, he says, where two or three people, minimum, are gathered together, they're congregated, they're assembled together, and they're there in my name. That just doesn't mean in Jesus' name as, a, as an addition to your prayer or something like that, but it means they're there in his name in the sense that he has authorized them to be there and do what they're doing. I believe that the church, the local church, has the authority of Jesus Christ to do what it does, and that is to preach the gospel, to teach the Bible, and to try to edify the brethren. Amen? And he says here, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So Christ says this. He said, There is a certain sense in which you know, I live in you, I dwell in you as an individual, but when you come together as a group, when you come together as a church body, whether it's two or three or two or three hundred or two or three thousand, you know what? He said, I'm in the midst of you all then. In some special way, he is in the midst of us. And maybe the presence of the Holy Spirit or the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, covering us like a cloud somewhat. Amen? To, to recognize and feel his presence. But look at the previous verse. Verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, well, prayer is asking, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now notice what he said in the context here. In the context, he's talking about verse 20, a group of people, minimum of two and three, that are gathered together to, in his name. In verse 19, he said, just two of you will agree on earth as touching anything that they'll ask, God is going to grant that request. Now let me say this, there are uh, there are certain uh, ingredients to prayer. This is one of them. Uh, it's got to be within the will of God. It's got to be within reason. It's got to be something that's prayed in faith. Uh, it's got to be a real need. Things like this. But he says this is one of the ingredients is this. If two of you will agree. So if you come together as a church, like this church did in Acts chapter 12 for Peter. I don't know how many were there at that time. But whoever was there in that church came together. They were in agreement on Peter being released, and they prayed, and they prayed in faith, and God said, or Jesus said here, that you know, you'll get your prayer answered, and they did get their prayer answered. I believe that's an illustration of what we just read there. I think we can have illustrations in churches across America and across the world where believers have come together as a group of believers, as a local church assembly, and they've come in agreement, uh, they've come in accord, in accord with one another, and uh, they have prayed for certain things or certain people, amen. Uh, there's people we pray for in our church that God has helped through some health crisis. There's some people in our church who pray for financial problems that have come through financial problems, amen. Uh, there's people we pray for that were backslidden that have gotten back in church over the years. Uh, there's people we pray for to get saved and some have gotten saved over the years, amen. But we pray as a church for certain people and certain situations and we can see where God has done some things. In your life, you probably pray and you see where God's answering some requests that you've done. Let me say this. Uh, your best prayer partner, if you're married, ought to be your spouse. Amen. You ought to be able to share anything with them. They should be able to share anything with you. And you should be able to come to, together in agreement to pray for certain things. Uh, you may have family problems. You may have child problems. You may have in-law problems or whatever it might be, but there's problems that we all have. You may have financial problems, marriage problems, whatever it might be, but you've got to pray to God. And the Bible tells us in one place that if you and your wife aren't right, 
1 Peter chapter 3 where it says, if you're not right with your wife or you're not right with your husband, your prayers will be hindered. They'll be hindered if it's not right between you and your spouse. Um, so here we have the prayers of God's people, the prayers of Christian people. And it's something that we ought to be uh, grateful for, amen, for those who prayed for us. All through the book, some people ask the question, they say, well, you know, it'd be, isn't it selfish to pray for yourself? You read the book of Psalms, who's David praying for most of the time? Himself, amen. It's not a sin to pray for yourself. You need to pray for yourself. You need to encourage yourself in the Lord. When nobody else is praying for you, nobody else is encouraging you, you're going to encourage yourself and pray for yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. By, as a matter of fact, the Bible uh, it, it tells you in, in several places in the New Testament that you ought to bring your request to God, amen, to get your needs met. But we're not just to pray for ourselves, we're to pray for others as well. Pray for others. Uh, many times in the Bible we read about where somebody said, pray for us, or pray for one another, or pray for me. Uh, people are always asking for prayer for themselves and other people. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Uh, this is something that uh, most people probably just read over. But if you read a little closer, this is a great way to pray for other people. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Right after Philippians. Colossians chapter 1 here. Look what it says. Colossians chapter 1. And... Uh, Verse number 9, starting here. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Well, who's he talking about? Look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. So Paul and Timothy, he says, Paul says, we, him and Timothy. Verse 9. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Uh, he's praying for the church here at Colossae, the Colossian people. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering, and with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of of the inheritance of the saints in light. Uh, we could go on reading that, but I want you to notice the prayer in verse 9, 10, 11. This is what he's doing. He said, I'm praying for you at that church. What's he praying? He said, I'm praying for you, and he says, uh, he desires that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. You can pray for other people to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. People got to make decisions, and they need to make the right decisions. They need to have discernment. And they need to have spiritual discernment. Look what he says. I pray that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will, God's will, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's discernment. You've got to have discernment to make the right decision. Uh, and why, would I, why is he praying for them to be filled with the knowledge of God's will? Why? Verse 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. The only way you and I can walk well pleasing to the Lord is if we have the knowledge of his will... And we have wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's the only way we're going to be able to walk worthy of pleasing the Lord. And he says also this, being fruitful in every good work. He's praying that they'll bear fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the fruit of souls, one to Christ. Um, and increasing in the knowledge of God. He wants you to grow, increase in the knowledge of God. He wants you to be able to learn more about God. How do you learn more about God? You get the book, you read the Bible, and then you have experiences in life that reflect what the Bible says is true. And the longer you go in Christian life, uh, you get to know God through the scriptures, of course, but you get to see him working in your life and those around you and know that the Bible is true. Um, and he says this in verse 11, and strengthen, he wants you to be strengthened, what, with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. He wants you to be able to be patient and long-suffering. He wants you to be able to endure the trials of life, and he wants you to be able to do it with joy. That's the prayers of Paul the Apostle and Timothy 
there for the church at Colossae. That's a good prayer to pray for anybody in any church, in any group of people, amen? amen. So we, we can praise God for that. Oh, we can also praise God and thank God for something else. The purchasing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. We can thank God for the purchasing power of the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you want to, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and look at verse number 18 and 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Paul, the, the Apostle Peter writes this. And he writes this because he was delivered in Acts chapter 12 from being executed. If Peter had died back then, he never would have wrote 1 Peter or 2 Peter and never would have been able to tell you these things. Well, look what he says here in 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Notice what he says here. He says, you know something. He says, you know that you were not redeemed. That word redeemed, redeemed means to be bought back, to be bought he said, you weren't redeemed or bought with corruptible things like gold and silver and money and cash and things like that. Uh, that's not what bought you and redeemed you uh, from your vain conversation. Vain is empty. Uh, conversation is your life, your lifestyle. And he said, you're, you've been redeemed from your vain conversation that you received by tradition from your fathers. That is, when you were growing up, you took on the traditions of your fathers and your parents and your grandparents and, and, your, and your ancestors and things like that. Uh, maybe if you're born in a certain country, you know what you're expected to be? You're born into a country because of a state church situation. You're a Lutheran. Or you're an Episcopalian. Or you're a Catholic. You know why? Because you're born into that. You're born into the Catholic Church, therefore you're Catholic. You're born into the Episcopal Church, therefore you're Episcopal. You're born into the Methodist Church, therefore you're a Methodist. You're born in the Baptist Church, therefore you're a Baptist. But the question is, are you saved? Have you been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ from your sins? I don't care what church you're born into, what culture you're born into, uh, you've got to be born again, amen, in order to be saved. And so we can thank God for the purchasing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Look what he says here. He said, we're not saved by all that stuff, by all, those, all that religi religiosity. We're not saved by our money and things like that. Uh, look what he said in verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, we're saved, we're redeemed, we're bought with a price, and that price is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Precious carries the idea of something that's rare. And it's very valuable and hard, to, hard to, uh, to imitate. And certainly you can't imitate the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, you can't do that. There's only one person who ever shed their blood for sinners, and that was Jesus Christ. And that blood was precious because it wasn't just human blood. I believe it was divine blood. That is, Jesus Christ was God's only begotten Son. And when the Bible talks about Jesus Christ in one place, it says that we are redeemed and bought and paid for by the blood of God himself. So I believe that blood was divine blood. The blood of deity was running through him. And he was a special man, amen? He wasn't, just, he wasn't an average man. He wasn't a normal human being. Uh, he was an extraordinary human being, amen? He was the man, of, man among men, amen? Um, and uh, he was the son of man and the son of God at the same time. And so his precious blood shed on the cross of Calvary is what bought and paid for our sins. Uh, he was there on the cross as a lamb without blemish and without spot. That means he was spotless. Uh, he was without blemish. He was without sin. He didn't have a taint of sin on him or in him. Amen. Paul said that Jesus Christ died for us and he was without sin and he did no sin. Amen? He was not a sinner like you and I. But he was sinless. And he was like a lamb. John the Baptist said about Jesus Christ, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, right? And so Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament and all the pictures in the Old Testament that lamb was representing and symbolizing the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, that was going to come in the form of a man. God manifest in the flesh and die on a cross innocently without sin and pay for your sins with his blood, amen, and buy you back from the devil, amen. 
Um, they're, they're one of the illustrations that Paul used in the book of Romans is somewhat like this, and that is that since we're redeemed, redeemed means we're bought and paid for. We're bought and we're paid for. Uh, we were slaves to sin. Uh, we were on the auction block. And Jesus Christ bought us and set us free from sin by his blood. Amen. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't buy us with silver and gold. Amen. He bought us with his blood. And so God has saved us, liberated us, emancipated us, and freed us from sin. How? Because he paid for us. He bought us with his blood. Amen. You don't belong to yourself. You don't belong to the devil anymore. You belong to yourself. Amen. Um, I, I, I remember that song that came out years ago, uh, Charlie Daniels, The Devil Went Down to George. Remember that? And Johnny had his violin, you know, and the devil had a golden violin. And, you know, whoever play, outplayed the devil and got the golden, you know, the, if Johnny could beat the devil in his own game, they're playing that, you know. Uh, he got the golden fiddle. And uh, if uh, Johnny lost, then the devil gets his soul. I heard that song, heard it a while back sometime, and I thought, let me think about them words again. Now, Charlie Daniels later on got saved, became a Christian. But before he was a Christian, uh, he, he did some other things he, you know, that lost people do like him do. But he got saved later on. So he wrote this song, I'm sure, that he didn't have his theology exactly right. But here's the whole deal here. Johnny was a fool. He won the contest. He beat the devil, amen. He outplayed him, Amen. And he won the golden fiddle. And so now the devil don't get his soul. The devil fooled him. The devil already had his soul. And after the contest, the devil still had Johnny's soul. You know why? Because Johnny never trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. He thought he could beat the devil, and he did. Maybe the devil let him win. I don't know. But the fact is, Johnny didn't lose his soul to the devil because he won the contest. Johnny didn't have a soul to lose to him. The devil already had him, amen? He had to be redeemed, and he wasn't redeemed. He didn't have Jesus Christ buy him back with his blood. And Johnny in the song didn't, didn't happen to Johnny in the song. So after the song was over, Johnny went to hell, amen? Until Charlie Daniels got saved. Maybe he changed the lyrics. Maybe then Johnny got saved later, maybe. I mean, I don't know. But in any case, um, you can't, you, the devil's already got you where he wants you. And if you're lost, you need to be saved. You need to be redeemed. And Jesus Christ has already shed the blood to redeem you and pay for you and buy you off the slave auction of sin, amen, from Satan and to make you one of his children. So we can thank God for the purchasing power of the blood because that's the only thing that can save you and redeem you. This is a great song here for, you could preach this on the street. I've got it in my little... New Testament I use when I do preach on the street, and I've got these words in there, and I'll preach this just like it's the Bible, amen, because it's still true. And this is it right here. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, and then he goes and say, this is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You think he's getting the point across in the song? Amen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So we can thank God for the blood of Jesus. Why? Because it redeemed us. It's washed away our sins. It's made us whole again. It's cleansed us. It's pardoned us. It's atoned us. It's given us hope and peace. Uh, it's all our righteousness is in Christ and the blood he shed for us. Not our righteousnesses. Amen? All our righteousness is filthy rags. There's nothing that can save us that we can do. The only thing that can save us is the precious flow of the blood of Jesus Christ that makes us white as snow. Amen? And cleanses us and redeems us and buys us back and puts us in the family of God. Amen? So we can thank God for the partaking of the divine nature. We can live the Christian life by the grace of God and the Bible. Uh, we can thank God for the prayers of Christian people. We can pray we can thank God for Wednesday night prayer meeting. And when we come together on Sundays. And, and I hope throughout the week that you have time where you spend in prayer. For one another, amen, and for yourself and your family. And we can thank God for the purchasing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin, amen, 
And if you're saved here this morning, you're cleansed from all sin, past, present, and future. And if you're saved, you're going to heaven. Amen? Now, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you've never been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You've never been cleansed of your sins. You've got to trust Jesus Christ. And when you trust Christ as your Savior, a lot of things are happening. Amen? You're getting regenerated and born again. You're getting redeemed. You're getting adopted. Uh, you're get, getting put in the family of God. And you know what else? You're getting washed from your sins and forgiven of your sins. The blood of Jesus Christ does this. What does it do? It cleanses us from all righteousness and it forgives us of our sins. Amen? And the thing that keeps us out of heaven is our sin. No matter how much you sin or how little you sin, if you sin, you're a sinner and Jesus died to pay for that sin so you could go to heaven. Amen. So now the devil's got you if you're not saved. And the, he, but you're on the auction block. You know what? And the Lord's passing by and he says, you know what? I shed my blood for you and I'm going to take you off that auction block if you'll come with me. But you've got to go with him. Amen? You've got to say, yes, I'm going to change masters. Amen? My master now is Satan, the world, the flesh, me. And I'm going to give up all that and I'm going to go with Jesus Christ. Because he bought and paid for me, so I'm going with him. You've got to make a decision to go with Christ, amen, and take him as your Savior and receive his payment in your behalf so that you can be forgiven and saved, amen. If you've done that, you're saved. If you've never done that, you're not saved. You're not ready to meet God yet, and you need to do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. We thank you, Father, for all the uh, great things you've done for us. We thank you for the exceeding and great and precious promises that you've given us to partake of the divine nature. We thank you, God, for the purchasing power of the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us from our sins and buys us, God, uh, out of the slave market of sin. Father, we pray, God, that if there's anybody, Lord, uh, here today or listening in that's never been saved, that God the Holy Spirit would speak to their heart, convince them, convict them, and persuade them of their need of forgiveness and show them that the only way is through Jesus Christ and what he did for them on the cross. And may they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Pray, God, you might help us that are Christian people to, Lord, realize, uh, Father, and, and, and more and more acknowledge the fact of what you've done for us. Help us, Lord, to realize and understand, uh, Lord, how great you've been to us, how good you've been to us, and what you've done for us. And help us not to take them for granted. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With well, their heads bowed and their eyes closed, Brother Matt, Brother Matt comes to uh, uh, play an invitation hymn for us this morning. The altar's open if you need to use it today. song in just a minute, but right now I want you to just consider the blessings of God, amen. We didn't get through but four of them today. There's more to come. There's a lot of things we can thank God for. We mentioned several of them this week and last week. If you can't think of anything to thank God for, hope you got something to thank Him for now. Maybe you do thank Him, but you just don't know how to say it or articulate it or something. Hopefully this will help you to keep it mind on what he's done for you, what he's done for us. And may we always be grateful. Why? Because the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth all generations. Amen. He is the God of all gods. He's the true God. He's the supreme God. And he so loved the world that he made, that he sent his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into this world live a perfectly sinless life and die as an innocent lamb on an old rugged cross and shed his precious blood to redeem us, to save us, to forgive us. If you've never been saved and forgiven, you can be saved and forgiven today, even at this moment, if you'll turn to God in faith and trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Maybe you'd like to do that. Well, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If God's been on your heart about your need of forgiveness, your need of being saved, you can be saved. How? Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask Him to save. And the Bible says He will. He'll forgive your sins, give you eternal life, and you can know for sure that when you die, you're going to go to heaven and be with Him. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for this day again. We pray, God, for those who listened in this morning and heard this sermon may even hear it sometime in the future that God you would speak to their hearts that God you would be working in their hearts to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ thank you God for the blessings that you've given us the 
the spiritual blessings in heavenly places, for the daily uh, benefits and blessings we see every day in our lives. We thank you for the breath we breathe. We thank you, God, for uh, the legs to walk, and Lord, uh, for uh, God, a mind to think, uh, Lord, a voice to speak, eyes to see, ears to hear. Uh, we thank you, God, for all the things you've given us and blessed us with. Let us not take any of it for granted. And let us use all that you've given us to honor and glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God's people said? Amen. Amen.